Today, we're going to be beginning our new series, uh, looking at the big story of the whole Bible from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. Uh, this series is going to last a whole year and we're very excited about it. And if you're joining us in reading through this Bible in a year, please use the app uh, and house group to chat through your readings as well. Now, I've got a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, from creation through to Abraham, uh, which is some task. And so obviously I'm not going to cover all the points or everything in depth in any way, really. I'm just going to be setting a scene for the rest of the story. And the whole sweeping course of history is about God creating a world and then a family of people who could know him, who could love him, because God wanted a human family. It's what Adam's about. It's what Abraham is about. And to begin with, then, it's also worth stating the Bible is not written to us in the 21st century. It is for us, um, but it wasn't written to us. It was written to people 2000 plus years ago. And this is important because the purpose of the Bible is not to answer all of our modern questions. How old is the earth? What about dinosaurs and fossils? Why do humans and chimpanzees share 98.8% of their DNA? Uh, the final version of Genesis, as we have it today, uh, according to a tradition, uh, Christian and Jewish, was edited by Ezra around um, taking all the writings associated with Moses that had survived the destruction and the burning of the temple. So that's a traditional account. Ezra did the final editing, as it were, of the Torah as we have it. And that's why in the second century after Jesus, Jews rejected the Apocrypha books, you know, like the Maccabees and Tobit and Judith. They're written after Ezra, when supposedly prophecy and the ability to write scripture had ceased. They were reacting against the new messianic movement around Jesus and wanted to say that the ability to write new scripture had ceased. It happened a long time ago in the time of Ezra. What we know today, though, as the Old Testament is very old indeed. And there's many parallels with Canaanite literature and Babylonian literature as the various authors before Ezra had written in that wider shared understanding of the world in the ancient Middle East. Now, there's sections of the Torah, which even the most sceptical person would admit, are written before the time of David and Solomon. That's 3000 plus years ago. It's a very, very long time ago in a very different world that was asking very different questions than the sort of questions that we come with our um, to the or to the to the Bible. So the primary purpose of Genesis 1 and 2 is not how we got here as in how it all happened in what we now call history. The primary purpose of Genesis 1 and 2 is why we are here not how we got here but why we're here it's about functional origins rather than material origins god assigning functions to the things that he had created so when you come to the bible you need to think like an ancient israelite you need to have that guy in your head what would this mean to them what i'm trying to say is the text isn't writing history as we would write history it's not trying to answer those questions about evolution or creation but People thousands of years ago aren't asking those questions. It's about the. It's not about the how. It's about the why. Genesis one and two. It's got clear purpose, clear, clear pattern to it. So let's talk about the seven days. The number seven signifies something very holy. In Leviticus, blood and oil are applied seven times to various items within the tabernacle and the temple. The menorah itself, the lampstand in the temple, has seven lights. Within the Bible, things often happen in periods of seven days, seven years or 70 years. And if you're used to counting in periods of 10 or 12, the number seven is it's a prime number. It does not give birth, nor is it birthed, 
by any other number within 10 or 12. It is alone like unto the one God. It is totally unique. And so Isaiah in 43, 10 says, I alone and God, there is no other. There's never been and there never will be. As echoed in the Shema of Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The one God is the source of all that exists. And so seven is a number that's set aside as holy. In First Kings chapter 6, verse 38, we're told that Solomon's temple took seven years to build. And scholars have argued that Exodus 20 5 to 30 with all the instructions on how to build the tabernacle are based upon the seven days of creation if you order the text that way you know you've got the lampstands standing in for the light you know it happens on the first section and genesis 1 1 begins this way in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth this is a story of the one god creating all that exists as paul writes in first corinthians chapter 8 verse 6 for us there is one god the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. All of creation is from the one God, the Father, through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's from the Father through his Son. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, for he chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Creation has a purpose, and you are part of that purpose. In Job 38 verses 6 and 7, we're told that God created the earth and all the angels shouted for joy. So God is not alone at the beginning. He's surrounded by his council of angels, his heavenly host. And the seven days of creation are about God building creation as a temple for himself to rule over. That's the, the goal of all of creation, that the, the earth will be filled with the glory of God. You know, that everything will become filled with the presence of God. And that's why there's seven periods. So God is bringing order and function to the world. And the first three days are about separating, about splitting up, dividing. And then the next three days after that, four, five and six, are about filling those voids, filling those areas, the places that he's just formed. So we have light and dark. We've got waters above and below. We've got the land and the sea. And then the filling of those places with the sun, moon and stars, with fish and birds. And then finally, animals and humanity. God separates so that he can fill those gaps with good things. If we think about the temple, what do people put in temples? They put idols, they put image of the God. And when God creates the temple of the cosmos, he places humanity in it as his image. All of creation beholds men and women as the representatives of God in the world. We're there to represent God in the material world, just as he's got angels to represent him in the invisible world. And the purpose of this story is to speak about humanity's place in the world. We're not created to be a slave race of the gods. We're not created by accident or just by chance. Rather, we're created to represent God in the physical world. This is alone why we're conscious on this planet. We alone can truly know God and then represent him to the created world. Paul in Romans 5 verse 14 writes, Now Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. So Adam is, is copied from Christ who was to come. He's made of dust, a temporary substance that fades He's a copy of Christ who is coming into the world, who Paul calls the heavenly man who's come down, uh, who does not fade. Um, we can talk a lot about Adam and Christ, but we don't have time. In the short version, Adam and Eve, and their names mean human and life. Listen to the voice of the serpent, and instead of drawing their life from God, they choose to become their own masters. 
and all of us follow in their shoes in the story of human and life as their name suggests separated from god's life they begin to die they are dust after all this wasn't a surprise for god it was always plan a jesus christ is always plan a adam's exile from eden sorry must be seen as part of plan a history is always rushing towards the risen and crucified jesus christ jesus is the very center of all the human history he's what it's all about god's ultimate purpose is that we might know our utter dependence upon him and come to realize that we do not create ourselves but are created by him we are dust we're made of dust temporary stuff that will fade now if we think about satan if he wanted to re rebel against god and get a group of fallen angels together you know the bit of an army uh, if god is everywhere where are they going to attack how do you dethrone a being who is everywhere present uh, who causes everything to exist moment by moment where do you assault <laughs> where do you go and fight um gregory the great argues that god is enthroned in the hearts of his creatures to dethrone god therefore satan needs to turn the hearts away from god to other things and the fixing of this world is therefore found in them throning God in creatures' hearts once again. It's about allegiance, making God the centre of all that we are, that we might reflect his light back into the world. And if you're not reflecting his light, all you have is darkness. So we're born into this created world and it fills our minds. As Paul says in Romans 1.25, they exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. This is our dilemma. We forgot what God was like. We turned to worshipping created things, to spirits, to angels, to men and animals rather than the uncreated creator. The pre-flood world was not a great place. I won't discuss whether it's local or global or those sorts of issues. Whilst the Babylonians and the Greeks remembered the pre-flood world as the golden age, it was far from it. It was filled with idolatry, with paganism, with violence. And after the flood, God became so angry with humanity again, always choosing evil over the good, that he divided us up amongst his angels and put them in charge over us. And this is the Tower of Babel event, Tower of Babel. God divided and he scattered the nations. Moses writes about this in Deuteronomy 32 verses 7 and 8. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided up humankind, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of his heavenly assembly. For the Lord's allotment is his people. Jacob is his special possession. Acts 17 verses 26, 28, Paul says, from one man he made all of the nations, that could be Adam or, or Noah, um, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history, the boundaries of their lands. And God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he's not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. For some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So these angels, the, the heavenly assembly, eventually lost their way. And instead of guiding the sheep like good shepherds towards God that they might find him, they accepted worship themselves and became the gods who rule over the nations of the earth, the gods that the nations worship. Psalm 82 is God telling them off for their bad rule and promising one day that he will arise and reclaim all of the nations back to himself. Verse 1 says, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Paul uses the word from this psalm in the Greek for arise as his label for the resurrection. His, the resurrection is the arising of God to judge the gods of the nations and to reclaim all nations back to himself. So when God was handing out the nations, as it were, when he's dividing up the pie, uh, he gave himself Israel. And that's what verse 8 is all about. The Lord's allotment 
is his people. Jacob is his special possession. And this is the calling of Abraham. The God sort of didn't deal with everyone else, but chose rather to deal with one man, Abraham, and from him to create a people for himself. So Moses in Exodus 19 verse 6 receives an instruction from God and it says, And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is a message you must give to the people of Israel. So this is God's intention in calling Israel, that they would be a nation of priests to call all the nations back to the worship of the one true God. Zechariah 8 verse 12. 23 talks about those last days saying in those days 10 men from different nations and languages of the world will clutch at the sleeve of one Jew and they will say please let us walk with you for we've heard that God is with you and this speaks of Paul it speaks of the other apostles and their witness to the nations but the, the, the nations would seek after the God of Israel that it is the hope of the nations and so there's this recurring theme that God gives to Abraham in Genesis 22, verse 18, that through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. The goal, even with the calling and the election of Israel, is that through them, all of the nations would return to the one God. So in Genesis 15, verse 1, uh, we read, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. I am your very great reward. Notice this language. It's the word of the Lord who appeared in the vision. The word of the Lord. And he spoke to him. Often we think a word of the Lord and we think something, a message from the Lord, you know, an audible message perhaps. But that is far from the case. The word of God is a person. Jesus Christ and Abraham sees him in a vision and says the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision it's something visual and so in John 8 verse 56 Jesus says your father Abraham was overjoyed to see my day and he saw it and was glad the purpose of God was blessing upon Abraham was that through him all of his descendants all of the nations of the world would one day return to the one God. So part of the problem, however, is our separation from God, our loss of knowledge about what he's like, our enslavement to the false gods who rule over the nations. And these are the things that Jesus came to deal with. He removes our sin. He shows us what God is like and he disarms those false gods, revoking their authority. So Paul in Ephesians Chapter 6, verse 12 says, We don't fight against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. The first few chapters of Genesis are like a funnel from all of creation down to a single man, Abraham, and his prop promise of an offspring who would one day bless all of the nations. So these first chapters set the scene for the rest of the story. What makes Israel unique? Why do the other nations worship the gods they do? Why are we here? What is our purpose in this world? And all of these questions are answered. That we're here to represent God in the world, to shine the light of God's consciousness into the material world. Our purpose is to represent God in creation, to be his hands, to be his feet, to act as he was at. But what went wrong? We, God was dethroned from our hearts and minds. We turned to other things. As Paul said, our, our minds were darkened and we worshipped created things. The world turned to darkness. We forgot what God was like and we forgot what it therefore means to be human. How can you image something but you don't know what you image. You know, how can you represent what you don't know? God divided up humanity and chose Israel to be his purpose uh, for his own purpose so that through them all the other nations might be blessed. And these are the, the questions that Jesus comes to answer. He restores the image of God to humanity. 
so that we know what God is like. He shows us what God is like by the way he dies as a man in self-sacrificial love for the other. He shows us what it is to be human again, what it is to image God, what it is to, to act as God in the world, as it were. He destroys the enemy's weapon, death, that he used to enslave us to the love of created things, to dethrone God from our hearts. He disarmed those powers and authorities and he overcame them on the cross. And by rising again, he's drawing all the nations to himself. And he's the, he is the offspring of Abraham, through whom all the nations are blessed. So in conclusion, friends, the first chapters of Genesis are a funnel from all of creation down to a single man, Abraham, with that special promise of an offspring who will one day bless all of the nations. And it lays the foundation of the rest of scripture. It tells us why Israel is so unique, why the other nations worship the gods that they do, why we're here, what our purpose is. These questions all find their answer in Jesus, the Messiah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, just as we're meditating upon your creation and the calling of Abraham, we pray, Lord, that we might be with answers of that call that we might be your image bearers wherever we go. Now that the image has been restored in Christ Jesus, that we may now act as you would have us act in the world. And that as we have received Abraham's blessing of Christ in us, the hope of glory. So we pray, Lord, that you would be with us now and this week. Amen.